Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today, I'm going to have trouble controlling him because he's, you know, like, he'll just keep on talking, but so bear with me. I've been me. very so, quiet hitherto. <laughs> hey, see what I mean? See what I mean? He's a bit, he likes a bit of colour and you can tell it already with what he's got on. Uh, he was a councillor and a mayor, multiple times the mayor of the city four. of... Four times. For the city of Port Phillip. Uh, Order of Australia. I had to curtsy when he arrived. You uh, didn't genuflect low enough. <laughs> uh, for services uh, for the environment, which is interesting, I'll get to that, and local government, which of course uh, you did. Author of six books, they were comic books, and they're only about four <laughs> pages long, each one of them. Oh, um, outrageous. A, a playwright, uh, a master and bachelor of law, so he's a lawyer, a barrister, solicitor, uh, a multi-award winner, boring, I'm bored already. But now <laughs> here comes a musical. He's written this musical that is going to be fantastic. I've heard the music and the story behind it is absolutely hysterical. Oh, I suppose I better announce him. Dick, hello and welcome. Hi. How are you going, David? <laughs> very well, very Good. well. What an extraordinary career. Yes, uh, thanks very much. That's very nice of you. It's been a bit, um, a bit diverse. When I was growing up, the idea I was drummed into us is that you have to be a Renaissance man, now person, um, that you have to do a little bit of everything because you never actually know what life's going to throw at you. So if you want to be a lawyer and then you find, actually I find it stressful because there's winners and losers. Yep. And, and it's, and I don't think I'm emotionally cut out for fine detail and... Uh, or being on time. Or being on time or... So the, uh, the, the, um, yeah, yeah. the trial would be over and you would arrive. That's right. Oh, look, we've hung him already, Dick. Stiff, <laughs> stiff shit. Anyway, um, there w so, you know, you dream up wanting to be a lawyer and it's good to have other skills because, or other interests, because you never know when your first decisions may be the wrong ones. So when did you decide to um, back away from, uh, and being a barrister is pretty big time. Well, uh, I was, everyone who's a practicing lawyer is a barrister and solicitor, but I never they? made it oh, to okay. the uh, bar. Oh, okay. But, you know, I did do court appearances, which I, I found terrifying, not because I was scared of the public advocacy, but because the stakes are so high, you know, you've got these quaking clients and I was in the legal service movement and the stakes were high, you know, they went bankrupt if you lost. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's stressful. So all of a sudden a politician, you like the idea of that? Lo local yeah, a politician politics. is theatre for ugly people. Yep, but at, also the, a lot of lawyers that I know are often either comedians or actors, aren't they, along, That's right, along they, the way. So it's, it's no surprise. But then, you know, like local council, the city of Port Phillip, uh, councillor, four times mayor. <laughs> so do they keep on kicking you off and then you kept on Yeah, so back? my whole thing was I wanted to be mayor for life. Right. That, that view wasn't widely shared. <laughs> amazing. I know, amazing. <laughs> Extraordinary. So I said, look, I'm here. I'm available. Mayor for life. So you, you, they have, you have a term as mayor. Yeah, have a and term. And then you're still on the council and they voted somebody else in. The councillors vote somebody else in. Is, yeah. this, is this right? Am I telling that, it right? You're absolutely telling it right. And it's all about sharing. Yep. I'm bad at sharing. <laughs> but there is an argument that continuity is important. You know, you only learn most jobs after a year so if you give a mayor two years three years four forever you know what's wrong with that what's wrong with that uh but it also is nice to bring in fresh blood isn't it you know that's true renewal's important but i don't like to talk about that in the context of my mayoral career right okay well we'll leave it there but <laughs> an exciting part of your life though would, yeah would've, no would've I, I, I love being, i love being the fat little mayor and yeah. um and especially in the, uh, you know, like a council like the city of Port Phillip, 
a very, you know, like it's a very prestigious. Um, well, back in the day it was. Now it's pretty uh, van ordinaire. Um, <laughs> van ordinaire. You know, funny. it's 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 lost its zing, I believe. It's no longer heralded as a um, as a breakthrough kind of council. Well, it could be though, if if it, they. You, it could be, but it's not at the moment. And right. the community is an affluent community, and it has pockets of conservative resistance to change. And so it doesn't change much. It doesn't. Right. It, it's not the same as it once was. Yeah. yeah. Writing. Uh, you book, know, it used to be oh. one of the, you know, the socialist republics of Melbourne would include, um, the socialist republic of Moreland, the socialist republic of Ma Yarra, and the socialist republic of Port Phillip. Yeah. Writing books. What sort of books? So I started off there. I, by accident, I got a gig on ABC Radio. Ah. And um, I was doing sort of consumer comment and business comment. And so... I could imagine that. Yeah. Comment. <laughs> comment. Lots of comments. Yeah. Ill-informed <laughs> speculation and comment. And in my law career, I became a consumer advocate. I worked for the Consumer Credit Legal Service. Okay. And, and our... KPI was how much you were on the media. And we ran these reasonably dodgy campaigns, but they were morally correct about exploitative consumer practices. And I was obliged to go onto the media and put the point. So for three or four years, I was trying to be a Ralph Nader and so you had a regular spot on radio? I, I got that after I left right. that job. Okay. So um, I had a profile. Yep. Then I got a job on radio with Mike Schulberger. Uh-huh. Long, you know, long may he rest in peace. Yep. And, um, or pieces by this stage. And um, uh, then... Uh, um, from there, I got other gigs. So I was on Channel 9, SBS as a commentator, and, um, and then I was asked to write a book. because, And I said, what do you want me to write a book about? I don't know anything. And she said, oh, I sort of don't care. Just write oh. any book. You've got a profile. We can sell books with that profile. And, you know, they sort of didn't care. And this publisher... Um, moved to Alan Nunwin and eventually had quite a practice in taking celebrities and making them write a book and publishing it. And so she did celebrity cookbooks, uh, celebrity, all sorts of celebrities. I wasn't a celebrity at this stage. I was just a, a mere commentator with a couple of gigs on TV. Yeah. The biggest of which was I was on Live at Five, which was the late lament of Live at Five, Dead at Six. <laughs> with Joe Pearson and Terry Willisey. And that, uh, that, that had a, a, gave me a profile, a national profile. Right. Okay. So I just wrote a book about money. I had a, it was called Money, How to Spread It and Not Make a Mess. Um, Are you good with money? I'm trained in money. So legally, I started off... Uh, doing co company law. I did a master's in company law. Right. And then I went into this um, consumer law, but not all consumer law, mainly consumer financing. So we okay. had low income debtors who were made, being made bankrupt mm. by people. So, you know, I got to learn about insolvency, um, credit law, um, trade warranties, sort of, you know, I was quite altruistic at uni and, yeah. and it was important to um, have an altruistic lawyer who didn't just do drugs and crime, but did commercial law because yep. commercial laws were used to absolutely screw with people's lives. Mm. So mm. we would have a number of clients who were bankrupt, and and you know people ask how could you deal with it, but you 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 not just harden up, but you you get used to it and inured to mm. the. Uh, issue of speaking to incredibly stressed, bankrupt consumers mm. all the time. Uh, so the, the art of writing, uh, 
did you enjoy it? Uh, do you think like, you're okay? I love writing. Yeah. I love writing. But, you know, it was my worst market at VCE. <laughs> um, oh, no, that's not true. I played the flute. <laughs> And I did that not as an recorder, extra, not, not a recorder. I did the flute and piccolo, and I did that as an extra subject, and I got seventy-five. That was my lowest mark, but it was just an extra six subject. But like, incredibly important for my life now, because I, you, when I did flute, you had to do a million scales. Ah. So I knew my scales backwards. And that meant I could go into any sort of band or musical. And I went into the pit as a, as a player in musicals. Usually I'm on, musicals. I might as well leave and he's just you know, like <laughs> going on his very oh, well, I'm on my favourite topic, which is me. <laughs> I can talk about me forever. All right. So <laughs> orchestras. Yeah. And so I was in orchestras, which is, it's an amazing experience being in, the bowels of an orchestra with, you know, 50 instruments playing sublime music. It's... Oh, it would be incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, and, and nothing's better than hearing an orchestra. Live. You know, like live, yeah. oh. And so, but once again, it's stressful because particularly the piccolo can be heard everywhere. So if you stuff something up on the piccolo and the international keeping it in tune is sort of a little bit difficult because it's a small little instrument but so you got kicked out because you couldn't keep in tune with the others <laughs> no i got yelled at <laughs> you got yelled at now now back back to the the writing so what else did you write or was it all books well it started that? off being this manual about um about money yeah i, like, I like this i'll do a manual about being an atheist not believing and so I wrote this thing called Godless God. And I went to my publisher and I said, I've got this manual on godlessness and how to live without a, a, a belief in God. And he, she said, I couldn't care less about that. You've got no name. You're not on the radio talking about it. Forget it. Go away. Oh. So I eventually, like, you know, I sent it out to hundreds of people. Um, but Godless Gospel was published. And then I wrote a, um, a secular Jewish version of the Passion, which was Jesus, Judas and Morty Ben Reuben, three good Jewish boys in Jerusalem. <laughs> and so that was... Uh, and how did they sell? The, the money book sold. Yeah. The atheist book didn't sell that well. Mm, funnily enough. <laughs> but no, I, I wrote at a time when the big atheist writers um, like uh, Hitchens yeah. and um, some of those others were worldwide figures. I remember I went to a, um, a, an atheist conference, the, world, the Australian <laughs> Atheist Conference, had all these great writers here and they had a book signing. And seriously, they were signing up around... Whoa. Uh, amazing. No one wanted mine. <laughs> me to sign their book. Well, what, what about the Jewish one? How, how'd that go? That went okay, actually. Because uh, the premise of it sounds fascinating. Yeah, because as a Jew, a lot of Jews have written a book about the crucifixion. Um, uh, what, a, a Jewish slant on it? A Jewish slant on it. Yep. Because it's been this overwhelming tragedy. For 2,000 years, people have lined up to kill Jews. Mm. And um, so we want to understand what it is about the Jesus story that got us in so much trouble. And my researchers were quite interesting. I found out all about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and they're not what I thought about. And they are uh, groups in the temple who appear in the gospels. Then I learned about um, Pontius Pilate and you know, Pontius Pilate, he was a total prick. And the whole portrayal of him being indecisive and the Jews are to blame is utterly uh, un unconvincing. But, but uh, Dick, you know, like, um, and we'll have to get off the, our little um, soapboxes soon on, on this, but, you know, like, it's made up 
the, in a way. It's a, almost like a fairy tale, the Bible, in, in a lot of ways, because written many years down the track um, and with people putting their slant on, on a story that might not have happened at all. That's right. So it's supposed to be a trilogy. And my main protagonist is Morty. Yeah. And he's just about to, on Masada, just about to be killed as the Romans invade. And he writes three parts of his book. One about Jesus, which went okay. One about Judas, which is half written. Uh, not Judas, um, Paul. Right. So Paul is more important to Christianity than Jesus. Never met Jesus, but... Oh, didn't he? No. Oh. He was the great propagandist for right. Christianity and then one about the final Jewish war when everyone gets killed so that was my big dream was to write that trilogy and I've done one and a half right will you finish it I think I will but I'm now consumed with this musical so all right well, let, let's go get on to the musical <laughs> yeah. because you've been baiting me to push it. But I, I wanted our viewers to get a bit of an understanding of who you are. So here you are. I, you know, like, I think it's great that you can play a musical instrument and that you're a writer. With your background, I would have never guessed that you would have or, and, and have written a musical. That's true. It's quite counterintuitive. Yeah. And... Um Part of the marketing is to say, look, we've got this fat little ex-mayor and he's written a musical. How weird is that? And um, so I started writing with a, a friend of mine and, of course, he died of cancer. So... Um, How long has it taken you? This musical? Oh, years. Literally years. And, well, um, putting it down and then coming back to it Putting later. it down, coming back, getting back on council, coming back. Was it always um, the subject matter that it is? T tell our, our viewers, what, what's it called? Okay, so it's called Not Finished With You Yet. And it um, takes place in a dystopian world where you have to get a divorce after 13 years <laughs> because... People live longer. So in biblical days, people would die at 35, if they were lucky. Um, but in modern era, we live to 85. So that's an extra 50 years stuck with the same person. So it, for most people, it's unendurable. So, and this uh, is law. In, it's in law the, in my in world. The, okay, so you have to get a divorce after 13 years. That's right. Yeah, there's no... You're like, oh, but sir, but sir, you've got to. But there's some people that still love each other. Yes, that's right. So um, there's two people who want to resist the system and essentially it's a catastrophe for them. They have a child who's fighting with them and just wants them to get a divorce. And they also have a friend who's gay and wants to have a child. And that's sort of drawn from my lesbian sisters-in-law who've had two kids. So I just switched the genders. Yeah. Uh, the music, I've been lucky enough to hear the music um, here at Yala. Um, you've been doing a lot of it here and it's performing at uh, the Alex Theatre where we film this. And I've been editing and there's only a, you know, like a, a thin wall between. So I've heard the songs a hundred times. And, uh, and congratulations. The music is, and the premise of the story is hysterical, uh, Look, but interesting. I, I hope it's interesting. We did a sing through at Chapel of Chapel and people stayed for an hour afterwards to discuss the issues. It's also a little bit rude. We talk about masturbation and lubricant and all sorts of naughty things. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it tries to be addressing those issues of long-term middle-aged love. So at the moment, and for all of time, we've been obsessed with Romeo and Juliet, Cinderella, um, uh, all those sort of teenagers who get infatuated. So there's infatuation love and then there's more demanding long-term love. And so we 
try and tease out some of those issues. Well, what, what does your wife think of um, the premise of this story? As she saying, do you not want to be with me anymore because we've been past the <laughs> well, 13 I, years? What, what I try to do is to put both sides. So most of the community says, oh, Christ, if I, you know, I can't get my divorce quick enough. But the main protagonists who grab most of the emotional bandwidth are still in love and fight to stay together. So, but there's both sides. Um, there's a, a lot of sort of singing about having kids and whether that's important, but an important character hates kids, doesn't want kids, and she doesn't have kids. And there's pressure on her to provide her womb mm. to a, a gay man who wants kids. Right, and um, have you got children? I've got three children. And uh, what, you know, like how, how do you feel about having children and you know, like, are you happy to have them or how, what are they going to think when they hear about this um, play? So... Or they will just say, oh, that's dad and roll their eyes. Well, they, they do know that I'm a bit weird. Oh, I really? Was, <laughs> Look was, at the outfit alone. <laughs> so I was, in a, um, I was in an opera with Emotion Works um, and it was about a sex worker and um, so we did it at a strip joint in the city the men's gallery and I had to do a strip and tap dance at the same time and how long ago was this oh a few years right so the, the, the slender a bit, slightly more slender version <laughs> <laughs> so um, so they saw that and they've seen sing-throughs of songs I've written about lubricant and masturbation. So they just accept you? Yeah, I think they support me too. They're Do they? they semi-well adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, so I, I think um, when I was growing up, I never thought I wanted kids. But now that I've had them, I've adjusted my preconceptions to say, you know, they're yeah. an important part of my life. So, yeah. um, but it is the big, to be pretentious, ontological issue is um, you've got a limited time on, on earth and ontology being the study of the meaning of life. What gives us meaning? I mean, you get a lot of meaning from this show uh, and that's great. And I think the search for meaning leads to excellence and But and there, there is no excellence, is there? Well, is there excellence in life? I wouldn't say so. Well, look, it's about legacy. It's about doing stuff. And um, what is it that drives itself, ourselves to do stuff? Mm. We're so affluent now, we could sit at home and eat chocolate all day, every day. But a lot of us don't, and driven by maybe the fear of death, maybe ontological drives to find meaning and purpose, um, maybe that drives us to do stuff. Mm. And whether it's this show is peerless and excellent is sort of beside the point. It's a legacy of you and those two stupid brothers who ru help you run it. Um, and uh, um, it, it's an important part of the local scene. Yeah. And I wouldn't diminish it by saying, oh, I don't think it's excellent. I don't think that's actually true. You're bringing out conversations that aren't necessarily bored out. You're providing for a, an audience, and we know it's a six-figure audience, um, it's a serious contribution and it drives you and it rewards you. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. But what do you want out of this musical? The what, same. The same. But what about the stress levels of what you're doing? Because you told me off camera, you can tell our audience. Oh, look, it's, it's a fucking nightmare <laughs> because... Um, you're producing it as I'm well. I'm producing aren't you? it. So I've got all of these people relying on me. And all of these people whose 
essence is derived from them being theatricals. And some of them, all of them really, are just amazing. You know, they sing, they dance, they act. They're gorgeous to look at. One of our, um, there's a daughter and she's a new graduate from the VCA. Oh, lovely. We recruited people with a casting director who went to agents. She didn't have an agent, but the casting director um, uh, had been to the graduate performance yeah, of yep. the VCA and said, wow. I want her. And then she auditioned and I said, I want her. Yeah, brilliant. And she looks like Christy Whelan Brown, who's the star of the, the show. The star of the show and whose daughter she is. Yeah. So um, so we're giving people opportunity. We're opening the Alex Theatre, which has been absolutely hit to leg by COVID. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of expenditure, a lot of opportunity and a lot of risk. Are you happy that you've you know, got this far and you're only you know, like a few weeks away from opening? Are you happy? Or Look, you, I, I am happy. Or you're an anxious? You know, I ask myself, when I get involved in these sorts of projects that are stressful, I drive around and see people with uh, more pedestrian jobs and envy them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, you know, I say to myself, I, I, I wish I was just doing this pedestrian job, repetitive job. But I know if I had that job, I'd be going crazy. Dreaming. Yeah, dreaming. Yeah. It's dreaming. So I'm a constantly dreaming. And, and so in one sense, I'm living the dream. But you never live the dream because your expectations are always so inflated that you'll have remarkable success without taking risks and without doing any work and without... Um, having to employ people. All of those assumptions are wrong. Mm. So, yes, I'm stressed out, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, I really hope that it will do well. But I, I've had quite a lot of cultural product, you know, books and, uh, and musicals, and none of them have punched the lights out. And so I know that, you know, I will have to have that internal conversation. Well, at least I had a go and at least, you know, it entertained yep. and employed some people. And thank God you've had a go. And yeah, yeah. Like, well, oh, I don't know you. about God, but thank, thank goodness you've, you've had the go. Congratulations oh. on doing it. And, um, and as I said, I've heard the music. It's fantastic. The, the, the storyline is really fun and exciting. And really good story. As you said, there's two points of view are running through it all. So Dick, you know, I can't wait to see it. And oh, it will be a smash for you. I know oh, it will thanks. be. Well, you're very nice, David. I can't wait to, for you to see it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Pleasure. You've been watching The Art Hunter, I'm David Hunt, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.